Hi, welcome to Design Disruption. Uh, we are very excited uh, to be here with you, and uh, we are uh, talking uh, about a, a subject that is very, very important to all of you and to all of us, which is uh, which is the uh, the issue of equity in design, the issue of uh, a just city. And it's something that uh, certainly has been on all of our minds since the pandemic, since the Black Lives Matter protest, and something that should uh, honestly have been on all our minds uh, uh, for decades. And um, obviously it's been in the, been around, but now is a, is a time to really look at it and really look about uh, what are the mistakes we've made in our cities? What are the mistakes we've made as planners and designers? Because we've made plenty of them. Um, so, Pratma, uh, why don't you introduce uh, our guest, who we're extremely honored to have. Thank you, Sam, and welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Design Disruption. There's a saying which goes, we are in the same storm, but not in the same boat. This has been especially true of the crisis that the world has been facing today, which has affected some more than others. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really amplified the existing uh, fractures in our communities. And the legacy of inequality and exclusion uh, has made some people more vulnerable to this crisis, uh, like with other challenges that we continue to face, like climate change. Um, and it has really emphasized the disturbing reality that vulnerable groups continue to face challenges in accessing equal opportunities uh, in their cities. So today we are so thrilled to host this important discussion on the idea of uh, designing for the just city with Professor Tony Griffin, who's a professor of practice at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. She's also the founder of Just City Lab, which investigates how to design and plan uh, for cities that are just. Uh, and she's also the founder of Urban AC, which is a practice based in New York. Tony, thank you so much for joining us this um, for this episode of Design Disruption. We are so excited to speak with you. Uh, I know you have some slides to show us to kind of lay out the groundwork for what we mean by just city. So I'm gonna uh, request you to share that with us. And I also wanna quickly ask you how you've been uh, doing during this uh, year, which has been pretty topsy-turvy for all of us. Uh, well, thank you both uh, for inviting me to this forum. Uh, you know, I haven't been on an airplane or <laughs> since March seventh yeah. of this year. Uh, so, in some ways, it's felt like you know a never-ending series of Mondays <laughs> yeah. because everything happens in the exact same space uh, in my uh, home and office here in Harlem in New York. Um, but on the other hand, I feel like I have engaged with people from all over the world in a way that I wouldn't normally do um, through this experience. So it's it's certainly a, a mixed bag of emotions and experiences. And like you, you know, you've been we've all been quite inventive in the ways in which we try to stay connected in the way we lean into activism. And you know, we keep going. Uh, so thanks for setting up this platform and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, to this hour. So, you know, I, you know um, I often, you know, come into these things kind of blind. So <laughs> uh, let's see if, if I share uh, just a handful of slides to give you just some insights on how I come to this work and, and why the frame of justice is really what I'm centering in my work, not equity. Um, maybe starts with uh, how I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. So this is a picture of my first grade class. Uh, and you might notice that most people in this class look like me, if not all of them. And so this was my normal. Um, Chicago is a very segregated city. South Side is predominantly black. And so my normal was being amongst um, students that look like me, teachers who look like me, and, you know, um, experiencing life on the South Side as a pretty happy uh, child. Um, 
was my experience and there I am. Um, <laughs> once I decided I wanted to be an architect at the age of 14, uh, I was quickly introduced to this notion that perhaps my experience of the world was not normal and was then sort of uh, positioned to understand that what's normal in architecture is predominantly white in this United States and that the world broadly in the types of contexts that I, I might have the good fortune to work in at SLM, which is where I started my architecture career, were also white. So here I am, you know, a, a young uh, student and then professional, um, beginning to understand my blackness in a very different way um, as a woman, as a human being, but in the profession of design more specifically. There I am in this class at the University of Notre Dame. Um, so I'm going to fast forward through a number of years of work at SOM and then pivoting into the public sector to um, be deputy planning director and planning director in many U.S. cities uh, to starting my own firm called Urban American City. And through a number of different experiences, in part of which was questioning the work I was doing in, in, in corporate practice in the public sector, whether I was really making a meaningful difference through design as an architect and or planner in issues of social and spatial justice that I continue to confront. So my practice is rooted in something I call just urbanism, which is this disruptive framework of policies and practices that produce outcomes designed to break down historic structures and systems of oppression, uh, inequality, and access. And I root this in 10 very important principles that are restorative, disruptive, values-based, cultural competency, cross-disciplinary, community expertise, inclusive of grassroots and grass tops, political and accountable. I came to this work also by having the opportunity to create a, a research uh, agenda and platform first at the City College of New York and now at Harvard's Graduate School of Design called the Just City Lab. And here through a number of different uh, forms of publication, writing, developing metrics and indicators of justice, collecting a catalog of best practices of design, we've come to frame our notion of a just city as where all people and communities, but especially the least not included, have access to networks and environments that offer the opportunities and resources to be productive, prosperous, advancing social, economic, mobility, and agency. Now, this may seem like a lot for a design community, but where I've come in my career is that designers have to embrace a, a, a broader multiplicity of issues, even as they address um, solutions through a, a design lens. One of the key components of our work at the Just City Lab is this just language. I was really quite um, uh, constrained by um, the notion that my only way of leaning into this work was through a lens of justice, sustainability, and resiliency. And in fact, in talking to people on the ground in different cities, uh, they lacked a broader language to more specifically discuss these issues as it related to their cities and their context. And the big part of this framework and why it is so robust with 50 values is because we believe there is no one just city and that a just city is very tied to place. Um, we explore this also in the classroom through design studios. This is a publication that we're completing called Provocations to Disrupt Injustice in St. Louis. Well, we first have to name injustice if we are in fact to do work that is justice centered. So the students create uh, a version uh, of Jay-Z's 99 problems and they identify 99 distinct problems in St. Louis. And through that work develop specific thematics like disrupting xenophobia and then figuring out how to apply a values-based approach to design in this particular example called Faith Multiplied, uh, this student produces uh, through architecture a means by which to bring people of difference together and build tolerance, empathy, and inclusion as a result. So in the spirit of the theme of this discussion series, uh, um, design disruption, um, it is discomfort discomfortable, uh, uncomfortable, I should say, um, a, a, to make the kind of change that we really want if justice is what we wanna seek. And so when we're accustomed to privilege, 
equality and equity, it feels like an oppression. It feels like we have to give something up and it's painful. And so part of, I think the discussion has to be about how do we maintain that discomfort if in fact, this is the type of change we wish to seek. So hopefully that gives us enough to dive into some discussion. Yeah, that's excellent. Tony, thank you so much. Uh, uh, love seeing the picture of you as a kid too. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, really, as we, as we were talking about before, your background is perfect, I think, for what we're talking about because you've, been, you've worked as an architect, you've worked as a planner, you've worked kind of all across the design uh, disciplines. Um, and I was interested in what you said when you started talking about um, you know, these really important metrics, um, and for us as dis disruptors, or we like to think we're so mm -hmm. important to, to sort of disrupt design. Um, because it's interesting, we call it disruption, which sounds sort of, in a way, like kind of shaking things up. But in a lot of ways, these disruptions you're talking about seem to be things that should have been all along. Like it's not really a disruption, it's really like back to where we should have been. Um, but I'm interested in what you said that um, the, there's a difference, or you're looking more at just design versus equitable design. A lot of people have been talking about equity in design. So what is what, it, what does it mean to be just versus equitable? Well, um, we tried to put that forward a little bit in our uh, definition that I shared with you, um, which is that it has to work at uh, multiple scales and yeah. it has to consider people in place. Um, so, and, and we feel that equity, you know, could be potentially one of the values that you situate in your just city but not every city might prioritize equity as the thing that they need. Um, and so our premise is to encourage communities, organizations to interrogate what is unjust in the places where they're situated and then to acquire the different values that we offer 50 uh, to assemble towards what it means for you to be just. And, and so, in my experience, when I found clients and communities to want um, an equitable plan or to center their work on equity, when I ask them what does that mean to them, they're often unable to give me a definition. Um, right. But they begin to describe things that they want, um, which may be inclusion, maybe representation, maybe safety, maybe belonging, maybe empathy, maybe transparency. So the beautiful thing is that we have a language that we can use to be more specific. You know, in our framework, equity is about the distribution of material and non-material goods. That may be one thing that is needed in your just city, but likely not the only thing. So we're trying to encourage people to think about what has been unjust in their communities. Um, because injustice, has with it a certain intention, right? It is a constructive um, reality, which is also why we're leaning into justice and not equity exclusively. Um, in this country in particular, there have been intentional practices and policies of extraction, exclusion, disinvestment, uh, and dislocation. And so we do think that that system and the byproducts of that system require disruptive action. Right. I think it's so useful. I mean, it's also tricky because everybody has their you know idea of what that is. But the idea of you know architects and planners, you know, they love to have metrics, um, and they they have metrics. Like if you want to do a green building, oh, okay, we just look at the green building checklist here. Okay, it's good. Mm -hmm. but like you know, with just justness or or you know social good or you know values like you know like you said people are sort of they can't get their head around it because it's so nebulous so this is so helpful but also i'm sure tricky because there's so many factors that can go into it and so much so many definitions well it, it invites a more inclusionary you know discussion it requires those who want to have the discussion to consider um people and social constructs and cultural constructs. Um, so it adds this fourth leg to the stool of equity, economics, and environment, and suggests that we have to think about cultural and social histories 
and activities is a part of that stool. And I think justice is um, just requires you to uh, take that into consideration in a more intentional way. Um, and also, you know, I was really interested, and it, this totally started out as an experiment, right? So I was really curious as to how um, people in the field uh, that inform the built and natural environment would respond to the notion of justice in a just city, which is what born the Just City Essays, which is on our website, um, which are a bunch of essays from people all over the world talking about it, what it means in, in their context. I was really testing out um, whether or not people were ready for something that was a bit deeper uh, to get into and quite frankly, a bit more uncomfortable to accept. Um, we're still far away from everyone accepting the notion that equity uh, to be a baseline principle, so right. justice being harder. And you know, this work is also coming about on the heels of Trayvon Martin and, and Michael Brown. Um, so this language was beginning to permeate more into the mainstream conversation through these episodes. Um, uh, but for folks who are not uh, the predominant culture in this country in particular, these are issues that we just inherently grapple with as a part of the work we do. And so it's like everyone else is now catching up to the uh, acknowledgement and understanding that there's something behind why this is happening. And that this is a moment where we have to start interrogating the why and accepting the realities of the why if this exists. <laughs> Um, if in fact we are to truly be disruptive. And that's why I, I, I am, uh, and I actually am working on a publication now uh, called uh, Disrupting Design. Uh, and we can maybe talk about whether or not we think there's a real difference between disrupting design and design disruption. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're of like mind either way, that's interesting. But uh, uh, Tony, we both agree that uh, justice and inclusion has been at the forefront of conversations mm -hmm. on built environment and cities worldwide. And I want to, you know, quickly say hello to this audience that is joining us from around the world. We've, you know, we Claire from South Korea, uh, Vietnam, uh, Brian from Texas, Nikita from Peru, Ber Bernice from. Philippines, I saw Moscow out there. So and oh, wow. I, I'm talking to you from India and I want to say that the pandemic has really, uh, you know, highlighted how unequal uh, or unjust our cities are. And while uh, world over it has pushed governments to issue uh, stringent lockdowns and social distancing guidelines and, uh, you know, kind of put across laws that has never been used in peacetime, um, you know, to respond to this pandemic. But in developing world cities, like where I am in, I'm, I'm not in, where I used to live uh, before this pandemic, like Mumbai, um, for the urban poor and the world vulnerable communities, some of these uh, rules are impossible to follow. A home that is in the slum uh, of a city like Mumbai in the emerging world has hyper densities and crowding, and most people, um, you know, have livelihoods where you they can't work from home, and you know, a large part of the population don't even have access to water to mm -hmm. drink, let alone you know, wash their hands. And uh, for many years, we've seen political movements around the idea of justice and inclusion. I, I know the new urban agenda, which the United Nations framed, recognizes right to the city for all its citizens. So, you know, can you paint a picture to us if we did follow that vision and agenda of justice for building uh, the next generation of cities, what would they look like? What would those places look like? What would that architecture be like? <laughs> um, he, um, no pressure. Who knows the answer to that on the fly, right? Um, 
Because I think it's so multi-layered. It's not just about what it looks like. It's it's also about who's at the table to create it, right? And for who. Um, and so a lot of our challenges with our pursuits of getting to the just city is really about who's at the table to problematize the issue and then who's at the table to help create solutions for it. And when that in and of itself is not an inclusive table, you know, we missed the mark. I, you know, in, in the early months of COVID and then layering on um, the racial uprising around the death of George Floyd, you know, I was, you know, I did not have a voice around what I wanted to say. Like my instinct was not to jump in and mm -hmm. talk about the ways in which we've been thinking about these notions of justice. And it took me a while to think about why that was so for me. And I, and I think it's, it's because one, these issues are not new to me right. um, in the work I do. And so this awakening that the country is having and the world is having with these layered um, pandemics on top of one another is mm -hmm. sort of like, okay, well, it's about time. This <laughs> is, you know, we, we've seen the impacts of what a disaster can do to marginalized populations through natural disaster, if you think about Katrina. You know, through right. other environmental disasters, if you look at what's happening on the west coast of the United States around the fires, um, you know, so you know these things only serve to amplify what is already there. So it's kind of like, okay, so time's up. This is going to keep happening. <laughs> right. um, uh, um, how is it that you now change the framework of who's engaged in right. the work? at the same table in order to get to what it looks like. Um, so to me, that's really where the most significant disruption needs to start, right? Because the folks who are living in the context that you described with no running water, you know, with hyper densification and have been already figuring out their uh, design disruptions to survive, Mm -hmm. are likely in a really good position <laughs> to tell you and to be a part of the solution space for what's needed in the future, right? Mm -hmm. And so if they're not sitting side by side with those who have hold power today, I don't think you're ever going to get to the thing that we can imagine in our head it would look like because I think it would look different. I don't mm -hmm. think it's the thing we've actually seen. It is certainly nothing necessarily we've been taught in design schools if part of the underpinning of what we learn in design schools is a canon based on eurocentric architecture and mm. planning frameworks right so to me the start of building a just city is disrupting the systems and who is sitting at a more shared uh, a table of more shared power right right i think I'd love to talk about, because a lot of that is revealed in in your approach. I mean, it's so much about, you know, you you, you don't have like, we're going to do this. It's like, and then you come into a city. It's like, you'll, it starts with obviously with talking to people and um, really digging in. And I, I, I'd love to talk about, I mean, there's, you've worked in so many places, places that I really, I've been and I, you know, think are really vital you know these are places like chicago you mentioned some of the racial uh, issues in chicago uh st louis i mean geez uh, pittsburgh philadelphia um but i do have to say i have a soft spot for detroit i've been there a few times i have a good friend there i've done some reporting there and and I, i'd love to talk to you about that um about what you did with the detroit future city working with kresge and sort of even just walking people through that approach that you took there uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, this was um, the Detroit Future City was really the start of Urban AC uh, 10 years ago. I just quit working for then Mayor Cory Booker as his planning director and I didn't have a job. And I actually enrolled in 
the French Culinary Institute here in New York, uh, thinking that I was done with planning and architecture and I was gonna take up a new uh, creative path. Wow, I, I didn't so, know, you, I thought you, you just didn't have enough creative pursuits, I love it. No, I was like, you know, I, I think maybe I'm done with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a sort of dream of being a chef, and so I enrolled in Culinary Institute. Uh, started taking like this introductory class while I considered whether or not I wanted to go into the professional program. Um, and got a call from Rip Rapson at Kresge, um saying that they had heard of me and my work and had been talking with the then mayor, uh, Dave Fink at the time, around doing some land use planning for Detroit, who um, was coming up on the 2010 census where they would learn they had lost another 25% of their population, making them the second uh, largest city to have lost greater than 50% of their population since their peak. Um, so in talking to them, um, what we quickly recognized is what they needed was not just a land use plan in the conventional sense, but they needed a plan that completely um, reconsidered uh, where they were today, where they wanted to go, and the ways in which social, cultural histories, economics, environment, uh, education, culture played into the reconfiguration um, and, and re-understanding of what an urban Detroit would be. Um, so I spent four years uh, leading that effort, um, putting together teams of economists, planners, landscape architects, architects, uh, think tanks, to build a new type of comprehensive plan that in the end we recognized needed to center uh, the role of growing a new and diversified economy for Detroit, which would then begin to affect uh, how the city continued to uh, be formed through new design and development projects, um, how people could flourish in that environment, um, how to rethink about what density means in such a large geography of neighborhood, and how every neighborhood had a future, but that future might look different than his, its traditional neighborhood and therefore need to deploy non-traditional tactics of creating stability, value, improvement, and, and in some cases, ultimately transformation. So I think one of the hallmarks of the work we did there was one, thinking about different neighborhood typologies uh, that explored different types of densities and recognized green development as an essential um, component and activator of neighborhood stability and improvement. And then also uh, thinking about landscapes as infrastructure and moving away from monofunctional infrastructures uh, that dealt with water, energy, uh, waste, and thinking about how infrastructures could truly be multifunctional um, to address stormwater or heat or uh, cultivation while also being um, activated um, as recreation use and also as ways of stabilizing land values and creating more safe and secure environments. Um, so it was a massive three-year effort had a very broad uh, apparatus of engagement using a number of different tactics um, and using local uh, people and organizations as leadership of that engagement approach, such that today um, we find we're now five years out from when the plan was published that multiple organizations, multiple people um, in public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, uh, continue to use the framework um, as a guiding armature for the work that they're doing um, more directly on the ground in different parts of the city. Still a long way to go, still a lot of issues to address. Um, but upon finishing that work, I think, you know, the rest of the world began to see New York and its assets quite differently uh, than they did a, a decade ago when people thought Detroit uh, would be in the, in the closet by this point uh, and thought that they should just uh, continue a mass exit of the city. The narrative of Detroit today is quite different and I think that um, planning work uh, had a large part to do with that. Right, it, it seems like 
in, in a lot of ways, you're broadening the lens when you're looking at a, a development. I mean, people obviously look at design and they look at economics, and now more and more they look at sustainability. But now you're bringing issues of just justness and your issues that are just broadening the conversation. Uh, but but making it more effective. It's not just for the sake of you know we need to broaden this, but it seems like what you've done has has had a profound impact on the city, um, and not just oh this is a great thing to do, but it's actually no. I mean, and it, it was important that it be a plan, and this was also why it was important. It was more than just a land use plan, right? Because land use is the enabler of change, it's not necessarily the driver of change. So it had to look at a number of different factors um, that drive a city and in, in, in its path of um, stabilization, improvement, and transformation. It also, and this is really important, I think, for designers and planners that are listening, um, or city leaders for that matter, is how you balance doing work that is both near-term and long-term at the same time. Um, lots of times people in our work like to create these polarities between um, doing something now or taking the time to do planning. And in my experience, those things have to be activated simultaneously. You have to have folks who are looking at the very near term, experimenting, getting work on the ground um, and, and realize and visualize Planning and long range planning, in particular, is not intended to halt those decisions or halt that work. It is intended to set forward a broader framework by which that continued implementation can occur and inform, in some ways, um, how it's incur occurring to to be able to um, survive through these different events of catastrophe, pandemic natural disaster, et cetera. And so how um, organizations, communities, governments can figure out how to do those things in parallel is in really important. About a year into Detroit Future City, for example, we actually realized that we needed to bifurcate the project. And so there was a Detroit Works uh, track that was really looking at some of the near-term things that neighborhoods needed, while Detroit Future City worked in parallel looking at the longer range work. Right, so you're you're amazingly you're you're broadening the discussion, but you're also like, and that's but you're getting in there, um, and that's obviously something that I mean, I've, I you know, in my field in journalism, people if they don't go to the site, you know, and talk, it's like you yeah. don't get what you need to get if you're not there, and you, you obviously were embedded there, you spent a lot of time yeah. there, but there's also this this. But then there's something that you know you don't think as much, which is your kind of your focus also on data, um, which is very different from these personal relationships that you're building. So maybe um, maybe talk a little bit about. I mean, certainly in the in the Just City Lab, that's a huge deal. But the role of data, which is certainly something that you know, I think we all need to get our heads around because it's such a, a, a massive uh, part of what we're all doing now. Yeah, very much so. And it's interesting because um, that was a very data-driven effort. Um, and what was really important about that, and it kind of gets back to this notion of how you build towards a just city, um, is how you embed a certain level of trust and transparency within your city or your community that could do this work. And for a city like Detroit that had decades of distrust of government, distrust of business, you know, distrust of the big auto industry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was important that we build a foundation for the project and in, in, including, you know, the design work, but also the engagement work that was built on trust. And part of the way to do that was to build the work on data and build the work such that the data was transparent, right? Um, and so everyone had access to the data that we were collecting and accumulating for the project. Um, so that people could enter conversations with the same information. So talking about equity or laying, leveling the playing field, it's hard to have a conversation with someone and ask them to weigh in or ask their point of view when you have more knowledge than they do. So data is helpful in making that data transparent and building the work on data allows for a leveling of the playing field of that. You know, 10 years later, and we, I teach uh, the core urban planning studio the first semester uh, of students entering our master's of urban planning program. We have an exercise around data. 
And so in doing this work and then also teaching and what I've also come to understand is that data is narrative. And depending on who you are, the role you're playing in doing this type of planning and design work, we each can use data very differently to create a narrative of what's happening in our cities and communities. And so this is also very, very important. Um, oftentimes, I'm working uh, in Chicago right now in a neighborhood, a series of neighborhoods that surround the University of Chicago and the future um, Obama Presidential Center. And the neighborhoods that surround these two institutions are predominantly black and have been for decades. The narrative about them now, the data narrative about them now is very deficit oriented. It talks about um, uh, everything from being very really hard hit by COVID because of uh, uh, the nature of work that people have, their lack of health care, their lower educational attainment, all of these things that become this, create stigmas on uh, this particular black community. I can find narrative today, and we are, this is how we're starting this work in Chicago, by creating a damn narrative that is rooted in assets, uh, mm -hmm. that is more of an asset framing uh, around the fact that we should celebrate the fact that this is neighborhood is 90% black. We should celebrate the fact that the majority of households in this neighborhood are families uh, that are related. We can celebrate the fact uh, that there are anchor institutions that are the hallmarks of black entrepreneurship here. So, so data is a, a very important narrative tool. And so we, we have to learn not only how to collect it, but how to create narratives that change the frame for how we want to do this kind of justice centered work. Right, right. Um, I, 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 let me let, let me let Fatima go. I was going to say. Wait, so uh, Sam, I want you to. So, so Sam, uh, when we start reading more of your articles, we can start looking for your data narratives. Uh, yeah. That are that are centering justice. No, it's always there. It's it becomes we, we use it as a as a creative tool. That's true. Okay. Sorry, Fatima. Go ahead. Tony, I want to say that a lot of what you're saying about the just city is so linked to. Uh, you know, the whole value systems around democracies uh, in general, right? Like, uh, I want to say that uh, all the new cities and infrastructure that we're building um, in, in newer cities in India or in the emerging world, often we're building, we're not building for the majority, we're building for the 1%. Uh, there was this, there's a great mayor from a South American city uh, who once said that uh, parking on the sidewalk is a symbol of lack of democracy uh, because, you know, it, it's the city then is thinking about its elite and not just the majority of the city. And, you know, in a place like Mumbai, 55% of its people walk as their primary mode of transit. And that data is out there and, you know, the government is always putting it forward. But uh, all the transportation infrastructure is aimed at car users. Sure. Uh, at the budgetary allocation, it's really very uh, undemocratic. So I one of the themes of your work has been uh, to empower underserved communities to help themselves. Um, tell us more about how to, you know, use that as a tool to make change happen towards justice uh, in you know in this context of uh, you know in my city and this is this data you will see across developing world cities where you know you're we're not really building for the commons we're building for the small elite interests and the majority of the city um is not being given infrastructure that will allow them to thrive and progress. So yeah. are there examples where, um, you know, underserved communities can come together and demand um, better, more just, equitable city? Um, sure. And I think, you know, the examples that you're talking about speak to that, right? There, there are a couple of really interesting things in, in the example that you're using. One is such a great example of using data 
to change yeah. the narrative of the functionality of streets, right? We had the yeah. same example here in New York uh, several years back looking at Times Square. We're going, you know what? Most of the right of way is devoted to the car, but when we look at the number of cars versus people in Times Square, it's no disputing that people, you know, should be the primary driver of how space is allocated, not the car. Right. And so using data to reframe, right, the functionality of space, I think, is, is, was really powerful in, in that example. And so if there are ways, and this is hard from, you know, marginalized communities without resources, which is to amass the kind of data like that that's needed to position that work. Um, becomes a bit more difficult. And this is where I would say, you know, it is certainly important to arm and aid marginalized communities in, in shaping uh, the design of their communities in very active ways. But they also have to be met with an informed uh, bureaucracy or, 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 or sectors of power to also understand um, and be reconditioned to understand and, and analyze and assess in that same way. If we don't train our government officials, our elected officials, our corporate partners, et cetera, in the same ways, we're gonna continue to be you know, working against, I need to convince them to do this, or I need to convince them to do that. And so I'll, I'll, my work, uh, is aimed to be a tool at the re-education across sectors, not mm -hmm. just marginalized communities. And in this particular moment, I'm actually even a bit more interested in how I'm getting, you know, the elites, the elected, the trained, the professionals to rethink the way in which they are even um, defining the problems that they think they're trying to solve for. Uh, which includes more productive ways of engaging with the communities that are affected. Different ways of creating data narratives that are more asset-based and inclusive of understanding both people and place. And uh, ways of doing this work more collaboratively, where the initial table that defines the client group is representative of all of those different constituents at the start. Um, and so mm -hmm. I'm very much trying to figure out um, the collaborative model of disruption so that those with resources can be sitting with those who don't and that work can be shared. It's right. interesting. It seems like um, it makes me think of, you mentioned, you know, sort of reaching out to across sectors. I mean, you're really, you know, reaching out, that seems to be a specialty of yours and, you know, beyond your your, your, your discipline or beyond um, the little bubbles that we're all in. Um, but um, it makes me think of this idea that, okay, hopefully, anyway, we're gonna be moving into a new phase in our country um, with new leadership. Um, and there's a lot of talk about, okay, how are we gonna stimulate, you know, a recovery in our country? Are we gonna be using, uh, infrastructure, uh, like we did in the last uh, last uh, recession, are we going to be using uh, sustainability, like the Green New Deal? And it seems to me there's a, and those are being discussed rightfully, but there seems to me there's a huge opportunity in in, in equity and justice and looking at things that have historically been under invested in, um, and, and areas that have been historically, and that's not just in urban areas, that's in rural areas as well. But if you know, it seems like a huge opportunity for a stimulus that way, that the, the opportunities for investing in in under-invested areas really could be the next, ma a major portion of our stimulus. Uh, is that well, something? I mean, yeah, I mean, well, think about where infrastructure failed us the last nine months. It's in under-invested areas of the country, right. under-invested neighborhood. So those things are not mutually exclusive. They actually stack on top of one another. Same right. thing with the Green New Deal, right? And so, um, leaning into those as catalysts for urban reform, uh, um, the reinvestment in place, uh, the uh, the advancement of um, 
modern technologies and architectures and infrastructures and um, public realms, you know, those things layer on top of places we forgot just as much as they layer on places that we've been focused on. Do you think and that are changing? Um, so I think that there there is hope. I mean, there could be a great urban agenda uh, that is learning from the last several months of how places and infrastructures broke down and how the role of planners and designers together with economists and social scientists and healthcare workers can be thinking about the redesign of place, um, the reinvention of place, um, the reinvestment in place in really different, more integrated ways. Hmm. Right, and, and do you think, uh, are you, Hopeful that uh, a new new leadership in our country will will tackle those issues uh, versus kind of, kind of looking at it the way we always have. I'm at least hopeful that there would be receptive ears <laughs> uh, to to addressing that. And, and it, again, it's a perfect example of how the next administration has got to be working on all cylinders on the here and now, right? Because they're inheriting. Um, a series of challenges that are going to creep into the next year and some change quite easily, right? And quite obviously. Um, but again, alongside of that, what I would love to see is a group that is also then trying to project how we're getting ahead of it to be corrective and more forward thinking around how we can withstand things like this over time. Right. Um, and those have to work not in sequential order, but in parallel. Right. So I think this is a moment where we could have, um, uh, I, I want to find the best people who are working on the ground in very tactical ways to address the challenges that COVID and the, uh, the epidemic of um, violence and brutality will persist every day alongside of visionaries and folks who think long term who are trying to solve for the future because uh, the future is now um, we can no longer um, continue to operate with certain practices and infrastructures rebuilding in the same way we always have we have to take and learn from the failures uh, of the way our systems and infrastructures failed us um, and begin to develop in those new ways now. I want to dig a little bit deeper into your uh, Just City Design Indicators project, uh, where you you know you try to define the values of the Just City, and almost created a toolkit to evaluate how uh, design facilitates justice, and that's such an important toolkit for all of us to use at this moment uh, of huge crisis. Uh, but can you talk to us a little bit about that and how uh, design and planning contributes to conditions of justice or injustice in our built environment in cities? Well, there, there's lots of literature that can describe how planning and design contributed to conditions of injustice. Looking at public policies, you know, just thinking about the United States, uh, around redlining, uh, restrictions on financial tools, um, racial segregation policies, environmental justice that set up conditions of injustice, and how you know architects were asked to respond in kind to those types of policies. So that history is well documented. Um, we have two tools currently and working on a third uh, that we offer up as people um, consider moving towards more just cities. So the first one, as we were talking about earlier, is just city index, which is uh, a language of 50 values. And we have a number of tools on our websites that we've developed over the last few years that we've used in workshops um, and convenings to get people to discuss and name the conditions of injustice in their city, um, establish the kind of values they think are important in their cities and, commun and communities that frame their notion of justice, and then ways by which they can uh, conduct design exercises uh, that are centered on what would the what would that 
what would justice look like if realized mm -hmm. a design or planning intervention. Um, there's another design studio we did called Pattern Justice, uh, and it combines the Justity Index with Christopher Alexander's Pattern Language. Oh, yeah. There we use Pittsburgh as the site. And so the students came up with 50 patterns of justice, and then were asked to come up with 50 patterns of justice, and we index them based on the conditions of injustice and values. Um, and so we've tried to model a couple different ways of how you can use the index um, mm -hmm. to, on a spectrum from naming injustice all the way to um, developing solutions that are aimed at uh, realizing a value through a uh, built intervention. We've also used the index with organizations who are just trying to, to create a sharper mission or vision statement um, or direct their investments in a more just way. And so we've worked with the Homes Endowments in Pittsburgh, for example, who have embedded some of these values in their program areas and the criteria they use to do grants. That's one way that we've done it. A second way we've done it, which was through a research project we did with Gale Studios in New York, which developed a framework of um, indicators and metrics to evaluate the presence of urban life and justice in public space. Uh, there we looked at seven of New York City's public plazas, implemented through their public plaza program and evaluated them based on 11 different indicators and about 74 different metrics. Uh, so there is a tool that, again, we encourage people to use. You can download the free report that uh, if folks were interested in examining uh, how justice shows up in the public realm, uh, injustice or justice, um, some ways to use um, quantifiable and quantitative metrics uh, that allow you to understand the presence of how these different values uh, might be working. There were values of access, connectivity, equity, inclusion, healthiness. I'm going to skip some. There are 11 in total, so that's a tool. The third one that we're beginning to look at is around measuring neighborhood change and justice. Um, and this is going to be looking at um, the spectrum of how neighborhoods change through revitalization, redevelopment, and gentrification. And again, trying to uh, apply a justice lens to how we look at measuring and marking that change. Um, again, potentially as a tool for evaluating current condition, but also as a, a, a path towards thinking about more just solutions um, on the trajectory of neighborhood change. Right. I mean, that, what you just brought up, uh, that issue of revitalization uh, and gentrification, it, it, it seems to be something that, you know, very few cities, if any, have figured out the formula for that. Uh, yeah. And I know that I'm sure that's something that, you know, you can shed some light on for us is you know, the, the challenge of revitalizing neighborhoods that are that need revitalizing, but then not then bringing in gentrification or at least rampant gentrification. Um, and, and how do you sort of how do you sort of manage that? Yeah, I mean it's a complicated issue. In the United States there's a great um, study done a few years ago um, by Joe Courtright um, that suggests that of the thousand census tracts that were labeled poverty in the United States uh, in the highest populated cities in 1970, 90% of them are still neighborhoods of poverty. And in that study, he's arguing gentrification is not the major problem despite uh, how much media attention it gets. <laughs> it's still neighborhoods that have been um, underinvested and disinvested. Um, right. So just to kind of put a scale on the problem. Sure, no, that's a really good point. Gentrification, as people understand it, is certainly occurring, but it is not the the, the wholesale um, challenge of neighborhood change that we should be addressing. It's in fact uh, the fact that not enough neighborhoods are changing for the better that mm -hmm. perhaps we can lean into. And this is why I think the work we're going to be doing uh, around this is really going to be looking at the spectrum of neighborhood change and trying to think about, you know, what are the values important to each of those moments along the path of change so that there can be more focused and just um, solutions to how to intervene at what period of time in a neighborhood changes trajectory. You know, what makes gentrification challenging 
uh, may not be so much about the fact that there's new investment happening by a different set of actors. It could be more about here's where the argument is. Uh, it could be more about when that investment by those people triggers a dislocation, um, an involuntary dislocation. So perhaps the problem we should be focused on is how do we make those people, those businesses, those places less vulnerable to withstanding dislocation versus uh, or in such a way that they can benefit from the new investment uh, when it occurs. Mm -hmm. So I teach a class on this in my spring semester uh, called the gentrification debates, where we spend a lot of time debating the complexities of, of this aspect of neighborhood change, yeah. unpacking uh, the myths, uh, the upsides, the uh, consequences. Uh, so students are more informed about the factors uh, and the way, the causes, the factors, the consequences, the actors, uh, the time frames that are involved with, with this uh, trend uh, to figure out more effective ways to address it. Right. Um, what do you say, um, you know, uh, reminds all of us that while economic growth is uh, easy, inclusion is really, really hard to achieve. Uh, I spent some time in Seattle early last year. You know, this is home to the biggest global economic giants of our time. Amazon, Microsoft probably almost have economic activities, sizes of, um, you know, small or medium countries in the world. But there was a palpable kind of state of crisis and hopelessness uh, in that city. And, um, um, that, that I heard where apparently 20% of the city makes more than half the uh, city's total uh, income. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of prosperity in the city, but which is also surrounded by pools of homelessness and destitution. Sure. Um, so in this, and we see a lot of private sector driven activity in cities like Seattle. Uh, so how does how do you you know drive this economic activity, uh, especially you know, towards more inclusion, um, especially given that a large part of these developments are driven by the private sector and uh, the state's been kind of taking a back seat. Uh, you know how can we kind of design policies to ensure that even the private sector uh, has outcomes of justice as one of their uh, uh, metrics, or or maybe the city mandates a charter that uh, uh, requires any investment to look at justice as one of the crucial agendas. Well, what my 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 quick answer to that is um, that you know, folks listening to this call. Uh, students uh, who are studying design, architecture, planning, et cetera, young professionals, practitioners, is to go spend some time working for your local government. Hmm. I imagine it's people like us, assuming that this is a audience of like-minded people, um, how do we situate ourselves in the places where power is held? And sometimes that means, um, and I always encourage students to think about perhaps the non-traditional way that folks that are trained like us can be seated and have their agency. It's in part why my career looks the way it does. You know, I never would have thought coming out of architecture school that I'd be working for a mayor, uh, that I'd be working for foundations, uh, and having the different roles that I've had across my career. But I recognized at the tail end of my time with SLM that I wasn't having the kind of power of voice that I wanted around these kinds of issues. So mm -hmm. I idea to now go work for government was by design. Like I wanted to be able to take the knowledge, the expertise, the issues I cared about and try to use that agency to make the kind of change that you're talking about. So some of this has to happen by the way in which we infiltrate the places where power is held. And that's kind of, you know, uh, the answer is not in the tactic. The answer is in, is in who's at the table. 
And so I encourage you throughout your long careers um, to think about if this is the kind of work you care about, always figure out where do I need to be now in order for my voice and my expertise to matter. And in my career, that is suggested uh, that I sometimes seat myself in very different roles uh, to do that. And it's why I kind of say, we need these institutions to change. You need corporate sector to change. You need nonprofit sector to change. You need government to change. You need philanthropy to change. Um, I'm very interested in, in how I get that part of this equation to work. What I don't want to have happen, and, and I'm all for the empowerment of marginalized communities and strengthening their voice, and, and I'm glad uh, that you find that the tools we're creating are useful for those. But those who are marginalized should not bear the entire responsibility for changing the systems that have oppressed them. Right. right? So we've also got to work to change the systems and the people seated in those systems to change the way that they work. And the way that I've chosen to do that is to infiltrate people <laughs> at certain points of my career to be the man, right? And to figure out how I'm writing the code, I'm writing the policy, I'm making the decision about who gets land, I'm making the decision about funding, right? Um, That's and I want all of us to consider and be open to exploring when you have an opportunity to do that, to do it. Um, and if my career is an example of you can bop around <laughs> uh, and be in different places for periods of time to have impact, uh, I right. have a lesson that people might might uh, consider. But the the uh, the, uh, the the uh, system is not always. Uh, so welcoming to that. Uh, you obviously are a, a very good exception, but um, there's so many places that hold up infiltration. And one, one, it, a huge one is academia um, and getting people, planners, architects, people on the table in that respect. And I do wonder what places like where you know where you're teaching now at Harvard are doing to to really bring in a, a more diverse. And that's not just diversity. With uh, obviously we want racial diversity, but we also want economic diversity. We want regional diversity. How are they working to? to do that. Yeah, like, yes, this lift is hard no matter what, and you're not always gonna have success in the place with which you land, right? Um, but nothing is forever, it's not where you need to stay. Um, um, but we all have to make attempts to do it in places where we can, and I have been successful, I have been more successful in some places than others, so it's, it's not always even uh, two, but it, the point is I think there are different places to be to try to make change. And certainly the academy is a place that needs deep work, especially in the design schools. Right now, one of the things that we're doing at the faculty level is really um, retraining ourselves around understanding uh, inequality and injustice. So when these events happen, particularly in the United States around these uh, racially based uprisings, there is a reaction. Uh, and people want to react to uh, how we can respond and leaning into diversity, which at the baseline is about numbers, which is only part of the problem. Um, and, and trying to, you know, air quote, amplify and push forward those uh, when it's women for me too, or when it's uh, race based you know, the black voices that they have within their midst and sort of ample, give them space, you know, to be more present and, uh, and vocal. Um, I think that's useful, um, but inefficient. Um, because the reaction is taking place without a real conversation around, well, what are you reacting to? Mm -hmm. um, right? Like, why do you care about this now? And what, in fact, do you care about? Some of our early conversations were trying to figure out the what. And we decided to step back and um, have some real facilitated conversations to first understand the why. Like, why are, should we care about injustice and equality? Why is it important to me as a faculty member? Why is it important to us as a department? Why is it important to us as a school? The why has to center 
the work of the what. Because if you're doing the what and you haven't had a conversation about the why or what it is we need to care about, we're likely to be running in circles because we all share a different understanding of what the injustice is or what injustice means. Again, right. it goes back to why we created the index, right? Because uh, it would get too, too, too limited of a frame and we never spend any time talking about the problem. So uh, I'm happy to say that, you know, we're taking the time to really unpack that before or, or in parallel to figuring out more tactical solutions, because there has been work, particularly in my department, urban planning and design, where we've been trying to unpack this for a little while. But now we're trying to do that on a school-wide level. And, and, and I think that that's smart. I was quite resistant to the reactionary kind of work of just amplifying my work, because this is what I do, without at the same time interrogating the underlying Eurocentric uh, canon <laughs> uh, that is foundational to the GSD and the ways in which that needed to change, which right. I don't want anything to do. With, right? Right. Um, so um, you can't just amplify my work without doing the deep work of changing the sort of white supremacist practices that are underpinning uh, design uh, at large. And so until that starts to happen, um, my work is kind of secondary to that, right? Because this is not something new to me. It's new to you. <laughs> um, and by me doing it, that doesn't then become representative of the school doing it, right? And it's only one part of the equation of getting to justice. There are things that have to be undone in addition to things that have to be amplified. Right. Just some small challenges, nothing big. <laughs> nothing big. I mean, it's going to take some time. I mean, it, it's, it is generational work. Generational, right? absolutely. You know, there's this great diagram that talks about you know u.s racial injustice sort of starting back at slavery 400 and some years ago and there are many more years of that period and there are these smaller periods where we've gotten to you know reconstruction jim crow uh civil rights act to the day so we are just on you know a quarter of the way of unpacking this right yeah you know, the larger spectrum of oppression that has existed in this country. So this is this is generational work. Um, this is a, a, a very different time. I was asking my dad about this, how he thought this felt different than what he lived through as a child before the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And he said, you know, and what a lot of people of this generation are saying, which is what's different is it feels like there is a diversity of, of voices globally, in addition to the United States, of multiple um, generations, socioeconomic backgrounds, racial and ethnic backgrounds, who really are leaning into the empathy of this work uh, and doing this alongside of those of us who have lived experiences. And, and perhaps that uh, is signaling that we're at a very important inflection point to do some deeper disruptions. Hmm. Sam, you're on mute. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Tony, I just uh, want to say that this is such impo important and meaningful work uh, for all of us. And uh, really at the van, you know, you've been at the vanguard of that movement and uh, it's going to be useful, not just uh, for the US, but for the rest of the world who are uh, now kind of understanding how deeply fractured uh, our communities are. So it's, it's so nice to amplify development and the future of our cities from that lens, because it's been invisible uh, for many, many years and decades. So, so yeah. Uh uh, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And um, I think we're going to move on to uh, the next segment, which is quick fire, with some quick questions. But before we do, uh, I thought it may be useful to just to illustrate some of the kind of historic uh, injustices uh, from a planning perspective, just for, for our readership to have a little bit more uh, background. Uh, I, I, I hesitate to do this because we always have technical issues. Uh, Pratima, can can you see this? Yes, we can. Okay, great. So for, first, we have issues of uh, issues of uh, urban renewal. Um, obviously, that 
very very much based in uh, in tearing down uh, traditionally minority neighborhoods and and putting in uh, putting in uh, replacing those neighborhoods uh, with uh, what you can see on the on the bottom left that's Lincoln Center which which, which was uh, San Juan Hill um, uh, in New York on the top uh, and also Lincoln Square on the top left that's Bunker Hill a Victorian neighborhood uh, 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 primarily at, at the end of its life, uh, a minority in, in, in a poor area that became the kind of cultural and business uh, center of downtown LA. Um, and on the right, that's some more urban renewal. Uh, I believe that's in Pittsburgh. Um, and then um, uh, Tony mentioned issues of redlining. So here's a, just a few red ma redlining maps. Uh, basically, you know, institutionalizing where disinvestment was going to be uh, tragically. And then uh, you see Detroit on the left, you see uh, Brooklyn and Oakland. Uh, on the right, um, and just the idea of, of, of in the in the mid-century, the idea of well, we're going to have to build highways, and essentially, generally, where those were built were in uh, disinvested and minority uh, neighborhoods. Uh, so, on the left, um, that is, I believe, Dallas. On the right, that's uh, Detroit, and you can recognize uh, the stadium there. But that was a neighborhood that was uh, right outside of downtown, uh, a poor neighborhood that was replaced with uh, freeways. Um, and then, of course, uh, today you have injustices. Um, uh, Flint is a good example. Uh, urban injustice, uh, just the idea that you can't get, uh, you know, health injustice. We can't get good drinking water. Health injustice on the top right, where you have neighborhoods near freeways, and on the bottom right near uh, factories. But that's just sort of the tip of the iceberg. We could go on uh, for quite a while now to look at what are the current uh, current examples um, to, to continue. Uh, to some you know obvious things from history but today the list is not really i don't think any shorter <laughs> when you look at the yeah. injustices that are going on uh uh from an urban point of view uh, if anything they may be that may be a longer list yeah i can show you a ton of them from my own cities uh just kind of the road diet is a big example of it uh, even though like I said, 5% of the city has private cars, but most of the transit infrastructure and monies are being spent on that small group. Right, and the transit's a great example. Services, access to healthcare, policing, it just goes yeah. on at schools. It just goes on and on. I mean, when we started digging into this, I saw just how long the list gets. It's yeah. kind of incredible, actually. Um, so should we go into quick fire? Sam, I know we're a little bit over time, but we can I, quickly Yeah, back. this has been so fascinating. Yeah, but um, just enjoyed this conversation with Tony. And, you know, Quickfire is a uh, part of the show where we want to get to know you a little bit better, Tony. So we'll have a quick round of questions uh, and hopefully get uh, answers to get to know you a little bit better. Sam, do you want to start? Sure. Um, but for time's sake, I'm going to merge the first two questions. Um, okay. uh, uh, Tony, I know you live in Harlem, which is a, a, an amazing part of, of New York. Uh, do you have a favorite part of Harlem? Do you have something about it that what, what is your, what is one of your what, what do you love about Harlem most? Really hard question, but <laughs> um, I love that I can get. Uh, I love the diversity of offerings, so I can still get you know, some ice cream in my bodega from behind glass, <laughs> thick plexiglass, of glass. Yes. Or I could go to the corner and have, you know, a Harlem mule and truffle fries. Like, I just love that all of that still exists within a single block. <laughs> yes, so, I agree with that, you, that Harlem. Sorry, so how do you travel to, travel around in your city every day? Um, well, right now I don't. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> I walk everywhere. Um, yeah. I take the subway. Um, okay. So, uh, if you had to choose capitalism or socialism, what would you choose right now? That's an odd <laughs> question. Yeah, I'll give Pradam a credit for that question, but I like it. <laughs> this I don't like, like it. Me <laughs> <laughs> How about that? <laughs> Capitalism somewhere in between, maybe. 
It's absolutely yeah. somewhere. Yes. Yeah. Human capitalism, maybe. Um, okay. Who is your favorite uh, urbanist from this era? Or of any era. Okay. I don't know that I have one. Huh? I don't know that I have one. You have one? Okay. No Jane Jacobs? <laughs> no. <laughs> no? I want to have a stop. She's just not my favorite. I wouldn't right. say she's my favorite. I don't know if I have one, to be honest. I've never contemplated having a favorite one. Mm. That's fair. We we struggle with favorites all the time. This is yeah. Pretty, yeah. Favorites are not to always uh, <laughs> easy to answer. Yeah. yeah. It's it just... Someone asked me in another uh, a panel. I did a conversation like this. I did recently about my heroes, which I also just I I answered by unpacking hero as being problematic. But uh, <laughs> yes. that's a whole yeah. That is a whole nother. It is interesting yeah. to me that in. Uh, in architecture, there's so many quote unquote masters, heroes that are, you know, just kind of iconic. Whereas in planning, there's so few. I mean, there's a, there's some and not all for good reasons. <laughs> um, and that's interesting to me, sort of almost more anonymous. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I honestly, you know, a favorite urbanist, I just have never contemplated that. I think I, I draw inspiration from so many different sources, to be honest because I feel like I'm trying to construct my own, mm -hmm. you know, point of view and way I want to exist in the world to do this work. And so I draw upon so many different references that I can't say that I have a favorite. Great. Fatima, what are we supposed, what do you want us to draw? So we, you <laughs> and I've, and I actually, I really do have to um, jump off because I just have another. Oh, okay. Meeting. Uh, so I don't really know that much over. Do you want to take some questions then from the audience? I can take one question. I really do have to 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 bounce. Sorry. No problem. Sorry I went so long. Oh, so okay, we have one here from Arif who says, How can a young architect or designer contribute to a very slow developing city? How can we make our idea be heard or even considered by the municipalities? Well, you know, I think one of the things that, uh, um, that we now um, have that can we can fully take advantage of is technology and social media. You know, mm -hmm. our ability to create forums like this and push them into the world, our ability to get together um, to form conversations like this and push it into the world is extraordinary. And that's something I had as a young designer. And so, you know, when I was at SOM, I would be very active in other professional or community-based organizations as a way to lend my expertise into, you know, mixed multidisciplinary groups and, and try to make change that way. You all have the ability to create and push it into a much broader context uh, as ways of generating conversation, inviting conversation, um, and in in amassing an audience for that with which you produce and talk about. Um, you build networks, and those networks are then the things that can be used as tools to push them into spaces that you might not feel like you have the agency to do now. So, I would continue to feel unconstrained by the ways in which you can use technology today to discuss, to create, um, to produce, to disseminate, uh, to make noise, to be activist. Um, and it's been amazing just to see how people have been able to uh, generate yeah. engagement and real change uh, through through this technology. So that, that would be my advice. And that's a perfect way to end it. Uh, and yeah. in, in a way, sort of a plug for, for our show, but also for anybody, because we really, we want everybody to take a platform and sort of, you know, build momentum. Um, and, and Tony, we appreciate what you've done for that. And, and also really just appreciate you taking this time. It's a fascinating discussion. We really, really appreciate well, it. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you for, so much for finding our work uh, and helping us to talk about it and disseminate it. Um, if there's ways for you to, um, 
disseminate the websites of the practice and the lab, please do. You can get to both through either means. Uh, and a lot of the work on the lab is open source. So we, can, we really encourage you to download it, use it, adapt it, uh, continue to push it into conversations uh, that you're having uh, um, and let us know uh, how fun. We definitely it. will. I, I will be, uh, I, I'm sure we'll be in touch uh, shortly about that. Thank you. And, and we'll be happy to post this conversation on our website when the link is available. So do feel, um, please share it with us and we'll share it with our audience as well. Great. I have just posted the link to Design for the Just City where everybody can access your work as well. And again, thank you so much for uh, spending this hour with us and talking to us about this really important topic. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in uh, for yet another episode of Design Disruption. Stay well and stay healthy. We'll come back to you soon with more thought-provoking conversations. Thank you. Have a great day.